Okay. All right. Welcome everyone to our final webinar of our Reignite Our Manufacturing Engine webinar series. I'm Elizabeth Hibbert. I'm the project manager here at the Barrett Center for Technology Innovation. Uh, for those of you who have joined us this week in our previous webinars, thank you very much for taking the time. And uh, you've probably seen this list now. <laughs> you, you may have it memorized, <laughs> what I'm going to be going through, which is our housekeeping list. I'll keep it very brief. This session will be recorded. And if you want a copy of the recording, please email me after the webinar. My email will be displayed on the thank you slide. And please stay muted throughout the webinar as you are now so that we can hear our presenter uh, clearly. And then please keep your video turned off so that we don't cause unnecessary lag during the webinar. And then the last 10 to 15 minutes will be for Q&A. You can uh, type your question into me or Paul Sesto, who will be speaking momentarily, and uh, you can ask him your question directly. And then lastly, if uh, WebEx is a new is a new platform for you, uh, there's a video view settings I want to point out that are located at the top right corner or bottom right corner of your screen. And uh, they look something like this. So it, it basically allows you to control your video viewing experience. All right, so that's it for me. And I now want to pass it to my boss, Neil Mohammed, who is the director of the Barrett Center for Technology Innovation. Over to you, Neil. Great, excellent. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. And happy Thursday, everyone. Great day outside to have a nice webinar. Paul will agree with me. Uh, we had a, an amazing four days of webinars with the BCTI industry partners over the last few days. It was just amazing. And another great presentation for you today. It is our pleasure to be hosting with our industry partner, Javelin. You will have the opportunity to learn about how 3D printing can help with some of your manufacturing challenges. Uh, it's really, really a great um, you know, game changer for uh, those of you who are faced with some of the challenges. Uh, 3D printer can certainly help with some of these um, production runs and so forth. Uh, we have a great lineup of 3D printing capabilities here at Humber. So please feel free after the webinars to contact us if we can be of service to you. And our focus again, as Liz mentioned, is really to put, put back some support to the manufacturing sector and you reignite. Uh, everybody been impacted by COVID-19, but the colleges, the institutions are still open and we're here to help you. So please reach out to us if we can be of service. With that being said, I would like to begin the presentation. So please welcome Paul Sirto, National Education Manager Additive from Javelin. Over to you, Paul. Thanks very much, Neil. Uh, we're very happy to be uh, be here with our education partner, Humber College. Uh, Javelin has a very strong uh, relationship with uh, Humber. And in fact, two of our uh, technical staff are now part-time instructors there uh, for additive manufacturing course for the uh, undergraduates. Uh, but our partnership also extends to our vendor, Stratasys, as, as we team up with Stratasys to support Humber for their uh, commercial grade uh, 3D printers and all the applications uh, that these printers can accomplish. What you'll see today started with people asking questions. Do you think we can do this? And it's our goal that when you hear about the examples uh, in this presentation, that it will open up your imagination and, and what may be possible at your company. And then, you know, please do connect with Neil and Anthony to work with Humber proving out your new ideas and solutions. I'd like to introduce my colleague, James Karafiloff. Uh, James is one of our senior account managers. James is a, a PNG with an electrical engineering uh, industry experience. He has extensive experience working with our industry clients, getting them su successfully started with 3D printing. And uh, I, I asked, um, I was asked to do this talk. Um, uh, I asked James to do this talk since he has the pulse of what's happening uh, out in the field with our industry clients and the challenges uh, that they're facing. And I always enjoy working with James because it's, it's his engineering uh, side always comes through uh, in being thorough and uh, I want to say tenacious in his problem solving uh, to find the right answer. So, James, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, Paul. Um, thanks for the introduction. Can you guys see my 
my screen first of all yes yep we i think you just took one. took half my content out i have like very little to talk about now i'm just kidding and good morning everyone uh, welcome to our session i want to first apologize in advance if you hear any dogs barking or possibly uh, cat interruptions or people um home offices sometimes are challenging when everybody is studying from home and working here um, anyway, during the next 30 minutes or so, uh, I'd like to uh, be talking about 3D printing, how it's helping companies with uh, manufacturing challenges. Um, and we're kind of limited to time, so it'll be kind of an overview rather than, you know, really granular dive. And there is a lot of content in uh, manufacturing applications, um, different uh, different tools, different industries. Uh, so. We kind of need to focus a little bit um, on what we can do in this amount of time. And normally we do events in person and also can show parts, um, what the actual tools look like and feel like, which is also a great way of communicating. This is not an option now, obviously, but uh, we'll do with, you know, we'll work with the tools we have today. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll provide I'll provide uh, Paul's and um, Neil's contact info uh, should you need uh, more information about anything, 3D printing, number, uh, manufacturing tools. So uh, I'd like to start now. And, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that most of you are familiar with additive manufacturing to a degree, so it won't be getting into any technology or printer discussions. But... Um, just a bit about Javelin. Uh, we're, if you don't know us, we've been around for quite a while and um, have a combined uh, huge wealth of knowledge uh, from industries in Canada. And we use our expertise to help uh, customers with their um, current uh, manufacturing or design challenges in a consultative matter. Um, uh, so we'd like to continue doing what we're doing and uh, sort of try to share some information in this webinar. So what are today's manufacturing challenges? Uh, they're well known most of the time, but uh, their pressure to do things faster, uh, better. Um, the competition is pretty fierce and the industry is then transforming. Um, you want to reduce your errors, re reduce your costs, improve quality. Bottom line is you need to uh, be more efficient and have better return your, on your investments to be competitive. Safety is a concern. Um, there's other other areas like um, adopting to um, unusual situations um, r rapidly and re 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 restructuring the manufacturing process. So we traditionally divide 3D printing in, in categories. Um, one is design and development. The other is manufacturing manufacturing tools. It is an important tool, uh, 3D printing is an important tool that is available to, uh, to us uh, during product design and the manufacturing stages. And the design stages, um, concept models and advanced prototypes are very well known and have been used um, for quite some time now uh, with 3D printing being around for 20, 30 years. Concept models are designed to be um, to communicate the design early in the stages uh, so that you get a good feel of what it's going to look like, how it's going to fit, and when changes are still inexpensive and possible. It also uh, it's, a, it's a tool to help communicate um, the ideas within the company or outside to uh, the final end customer. And concept models uh, tend to rely on the uh, this the looks, the color, the resolution, accuracy, uh, surface uh, quality and material performance, such as rigid, clear, possibly, or um, uh, soft materials. On the other hand, advanced prototypes are functional parts that verify how a part performs in the target application, uh, such as uh, uh, robotics, uh, machinery, and whatnot. So advanced prototypes on, uh, allow a short, shorter development cycles and redesign cycles. They identify potential problems um, with the design earlier in the stages. Um, and, you know, so that 
flattening the design cycle helps get products out earlier. And that's something we all desire uh, to be first in the market, to, uh, to start um, using the products uh, earlier. So functional advanced prototypes rely on, on, different, uh, on different factors um, as opposed to color. It's more on the accuracy of the part, of the, the ability to repeat tolerances and hold high tolerances and material properties, uh, such as temperature um, and uh, strength. So in, in this um, example, there's a couple of parts here that, uh, uh, that are pictured um, that are actual uh, end um, customer prototypes. Now, where we're focusing today is, is, that was just an overview of prototypes. Where we're focusing today is on how 3D printing is used in manufacturing. It is rapidly growing um, area, and as more companies are adopting um, that, that 3D printing across all, across the industries, so businesses are seeing the benefits. Uh, usually, their time and cost savings uh, by complementing traditional forms of manufacturing, subtractive manufacturing, CNCing with uh, additive technology. So we further categorize uh, manufacturing aids in two groups. Uh, and first will be the jigs and fixtures, and the second will be uh, fabrication tools for parts. So jigs and fixtures covers quite a bit. I'm not going to read all the whole slide. Uh, it will take me like five minutes. But uh, they're generally for holding and guiding positioning parts for a given manufacturing process. You probably are familiar with most of these anyway. Um, a great way to learn about benefits of 3D printing um, for jigs and fixtures is to actually look at uh, industry examples of custom how customers have uh, implemented 3D printing in specific applications. Uh, the chosen examples uh, happen to be automotive mostly. It just happens to be a very um, a good way to demonstrate the concepts and automotive is concerned efficiency um, cost in, in, in a big way. This kind of sums it up. Doing things we've been doing, you know, for so many years need to be revised and adopted to new methods available to us. So the first example um, is, is, is a very complex part um, that was conventionally manufactured. Uh, it's a fixture for automotive glass alignment in, in the assembly line used, I believe, on a Ford Mustang. Um, so traditional manufacturing results in this fixture is made up of components that are welded, assembled, um, from custom parts and standard sensors and whatnot, actuators. There's a couple of handles there for the operator to, to hold the device. Uh, so there is there is negative things to this uh, besides weight. It's the, the manufacturing process is difficult. There is very complex angles um, in this in this part. There is uh, an unergonomic un placement of handles and actuators that the operator has to activate during the operation. So, and this, this part, if you look at it, it has quite a few operations that are involved in producing it, welding, cutting, uh, drilling, tapping, assembly, and whatnot. Uh, the other uh, potential problem, actually the other problems with this was the, the, um, uh, the hose routing um, issue. There's a lot of these little vacuum hoses running or pressure hoses. So you see that the redesigned part looks totally different. So this part was redesigned for additive manufacturing. And with additive manufacturing, you're not limited to, you know, cutting in straight lines and, you know, certain size diameter cutting tools. And you're free, you're free to design shapes as you wish, depending on the application. So this design, redesign leveraged additive um, strengths. But at the same time, I didn't try to reinvent things that are easily attachable or available from um, conventional um, manufacturing. 
So it's a bit of a hybrid tool, but it shows the best, best of both, uh, both uh, worlds. So it has integrated um, mounting, uh, mounting features, eyelets. The handles are more ergonomic and positioned differently. You don't have to worry about angles um, and welding. And so basically you have a, a printed base and then you're at, still adding your sensors and vacuum components um, and actuators. This is a like a very complex tool. The list is long. There is more detailed um, documentation for this one and most examples that I have in my uh, presentation. So, um, and and also when you're doing three D printing, you can improve ergonomics and positioning by printing draft uh, parts and getting quickly getting an idea how they're going to fit. You don't have to print the whole part. You can print pieces to see how that individual section is going to work out. So here's the finished tool. Um, material cost is listed there. It's a, it takes, I mean, under a day and a half to produce this part. And the cost is like $1,200. The weight saving, cost saving and is uh, quite considerable. And the whole part looks a lot neater and more, you know, it's gonna be easier to man manipulate, maneuver. So the weight savings, nine pounds, 50% uh, cost saving, and you know, 30 hours as opposed to four to six weeks through a fabrication shop is, is significant. It's to get your tool out on the floor in time. And most of the time in, in these industries, it's always a rush to get things going. Plus, if you have additional features to add as, as you're learning more during uh, using this tool, you can easily um, add them to the CAD and have them reprinted. Um, it also can be adapted to um, different vehicles um, or different different models um, as they become available. Now here's another um, end of arm tool. This is a very large part. It's actually lifting heavy engine components. And with 3D printing, there is a tremendous cost uh, weight saving and cost saving to produce this part. In a lot of cases, when you have end of arm tools also, if there's any robot crashes, you're better off with plastic, which will give or break rather than having a metal uh, part damage, uh, whatever it encounters. Hmm, I'll try not. Is anybody there? My slides are not progressing. Oh, there it goes. Uh, this example is another hybrid tool uh, where metal and traditional manufacturing and uh, additive are combined to to use um, feature, features um, of both to achieve a, a tool. So lightweighting fixtures um, is big for moving aluminum to plastics. And it's a great application for converting uh, hand, um, hand tools to plastics. You're, there's the advantages of weight, uh, time to part, uh, redesigns, um, repairing broken parts is all made easier. And you know achieving better, closer geometry tolerances is also um, easier. And most of these fixtures are originally made from aluminum because that's the way things were done and it's always around and it's the easy, easiest thing to reach for is just take another chunk of aluminum and cut it up. But uh, important in this application is ergonomics as well, weight um, and um, like I said, time to part, to get apart. And the difference here is it's quite significant in lead times. Um, This is a kind of interesting part. Um, this is a um, is a fit check fixture for for dashboards, and the 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 part you see in the right picture is a is made of printed ABS sections, who, who which have been um, 
printed separately and then glued together, combined together um, after printing, and then nickel coated for strength and surface, uh, better surface wear characteristics. And this was used to as a production fixture. Well, you can see this to make this out of metal, it's quite a big job. But when you're printing, it's you're, you're, you're taking the CAD files that you already have and generating um, uh, parts. Other uh, applications for um, manufacturing aids are holding holding fixtures for uh, complex shapes, uh, conformal. Um, fixtures for post-processing operations like machining, polishing, and uh, whatever other steps uh, that the part needs to go through to get to final stage. In this case, we're uh, looking at a fixture made of polycarbonate, 3D printed, and it conforms to the, uh, the shape. Uh, the design of the fixture has uh, derived the, its surface from the part itself uh, to produce a very good fit. Other materials are available uh, for this process, depending on what you're processing, what the temperatures are, and if there's any wear and tear from the part. This is a cooling fixture for um, injection molded production, uh, production part. Uh, it's a motorcycle uh, plastic piece. And when parts come out, large parts come out of uh, injection molded uh, injection molds, they, as they cool, they, they tend to warp. So a fixture like this is employed uh, to keep it in its place until the plastic has uh, set. And traditionally, it would be a little bit difficult to make, uh, but 3D printing allows the complex surfaces to be reproduced easily. And then you're you know attaching conventional off-the-shelf clamps and you know, the base is uh, an extrusion, so it's, it's, it simplifies the process, but you're using both technologies to achieve a, a product. The 3D printing is also useful for inspection and trim tools. Um, in this case, it's sheet metal forming. Uh, the black part would be, uh, in this case, it's a printed part as well, but uh, the white part is the uh, the check fixture, and the black part would be uh, superimposed on it to figure out if there's any angles or um, if the part needs to be trimmed to meet certain um, certain dimensions. Uh, here are some other examples. Um, of assembly fixtures, alignment and inspection uh, for inspection operations. Um, so the top left is a hand apply fixture. It's very manually uh, manual processes. The second one is a batch template. So getting the logo on the, on the car in the same place each time. Uh, there's gauges that uh, are measure the opening, make sure the opening is uh, kept uh, to the right uh, specifications during assembly. Uh, go, no, go gauges where you're pulling parts off and get to having uh, production, having a quick check to see if they um, meet the criteria. Headlight aiming. We didn't think headlights get aimed anymore, but they do apparently at the factory. And other um, alignment fixtures like uh, the hood, hood alignment in, uh, in new cars, new car assembly. This is cool, more cars. So small print, big statement. Um, 3D printing is gaining ground in manufacturing and automotive. And in this case, back to the badge application, um, BMW M3 badge was, was applied by this metal tool. The top left is made of piece of aluminum machined and assembled together. Um, it's It was heavy, had a sharp edges, so you can imagine at the end of the day, the operator may bump into the car and scratch it. Um, 
it was costly and took time to make it. The redesign tool was more ergonomic, lighter. It had um, has features that are replaceable, but also has, you know, has some assembly involved uh, just for ease of use and ease of assembly, ease of printing. But still, the saving is significant in time and in cost. Uh, looks better, and it you know having a lighter tool is always better for for the operator. And now a short video. Um, hopefully this will come through. I had some sound issues before, but this is a very good example of a business that has fully adopted 3D printing, supporting uh, manufacturing applications and, and parts, uh, prototyping and whatnot. Uh, you may be familiar with this company. It's called Solaxis Manufacturing. Um, and the video was presented by the owner and founder. Here it goes. Oops. See? Don't know what button to press. Where is it? This is an automotive assembly jig. It's designed to help the operator quickly and efficiently assemble all the products coming off a press. Bonjour, my name is François Guilbeault. I'm the owner and president of Salaxis, and we're located in Bromont, Quebec. We use 3D printing everywhere because it's our core business, especially for specialized tooling and then functional parts. They had targeted solution. They wanted to make sure all their operators could lift the desktop jig uh, by themselves. Try to 3D printing really help us speed up everything. Normally they get these jigs that are traditionally made in other types of machining 16, 20 weeks. We managed to do all this with Trisis 3D printing in three to five weeks. Everything was to speed up production. We brought the buttons closer to the operator. We bought the clips closer to the operator. It was really optimized on every version of subsequent projects. The benefit for our customers of having jig uh, redesigned and modified helped us to uh, reduce their cycle time by four seconds per cycle, knowing that they're doing almost 250,000 parts per year. Also, uh, the fact of having a plastic jig instead of metal jig allows them to reduce the, the weight of the jig. So it's very lightweight, only about 28 pounds. Trasis 3 printers are mostly unique because of the, the fact of having thermal plastics. So extruded plastics allows us to have really uh, stronger parts. You don't need to think about the tooling. You're really free to create however you want the part. We started with one Trasis 3D printing system, and now because of the man, we're up to five. In the automotive industry, 3D printing is really moving from prototyping to manufacturing applications. It's really in supporting tier two or tier three uh, manufacturers that are supplying automotive industry, large OEMs, get all their product out there faster. Oh, that was nice. Yeah, he, he's actually up to, up to seven or eight already. Um, let me move on now. Okay, so going back to um, some more applications, uh, circuit parts are a very good fit as well. And, you know, circuit parts are used in proving out CNC um, programming other and other um, production steps uh, where part holding, part handling is, um, part conveyance is being used. Sometimes, um, it's used when you don't have a part yet, but you want to prepare your, your line to mat, to handle it. Like an automotive that's, automotive, that's very common. So you have your assembly line prepared to take the first part for fine tuning. Or if you're working with parts that are expensive or, or have long lead times, then you, you don't want to risk, um, risk any form of damage. So you, you put through a, a surrogate part made of plastic and prove out your process, train the operators, and make all the mistakes in plastic, and then 
put the real parts into play. End of arm tooling was touched on earlier, but this is a, a, a good example. We have extensive documentation on this one as well. Um, in this case, traditionally made of metal and present a very good opportunity for redesign into, into a thermoplastic. Uh, in this case study, um, Genesis, I believe Genesis Robotics, uh, completely redesigned the end of arm tool um, from that assembly of metal parts, which uh, which you will see in a picture soon, uh, to a very integrated plastic part uh, seen in this picture, and we'll compare them. So in the top picture, that's the end of arm tool, um, going all the way down to the yellowish part that mounts, the, which is the, the the mounting piece for the robot end of arm. And the bottom picture is a plastic version of the tool, which looks very clean and simple, has no moving parts attached to it. Um, so the, the, the part was made from Ultim 985, uh, which is a very strong material and resistant to um, a lot of chemicals and solvents. And the, the overall saving is, it says about 85% time, uh, time reduction to produce this part and 94 in cost. So that's a significant saving in, in, in this tool. Plus you, the other ad, added benefit is that the tool weighed um, 1.4 kilograms instead of 16. You can imagine this is a huge weight saving for the robot, whether you, you can scale it down to a smaller one or it'll be like a lot wet, less wear and tear um, on the mach machine as, uh, in itself. And this, all this piece did was hold a part uh, uh, for a water jet cutting process. So in the bottom picture, there is actually, looks like a water jet coming across a part, a right angle part that's being vacuum held in the uh, Genesis plastic part. So a couple of things that helped also is that there was less attachments to the outside, less hoses to get broken or cut by the water jet. And uh, the design was easy to replace in case the robot crashed this as well. So this shows a few iterations they went through and this is something that you're able to do with 3D printing is, is iterate on the design until you get it to the way, working the way you, um, uh, the way you want it to be. And you, you have full control over the process. You don't have to wait two weeks to get parts out of a, a, you know assembly. The picture on the right, the graphic shows a cutaway kind of, of how uh, one of the features that's integrated into um, the part that you 3D print, it's a vacuum channel that comes to the top right angle surface for holding the part. This eliminates so the hose, the, the actual vacuum connection is halfway down in the middle, facing perpendicularly, and that keeps hoses away from the, the watershed area. The forming tools, um, fabrication tools, are tools I mentioned for making and use parts, and fabrication tools can can be many many different. Uh, types. The top left is a vacuum forming tool, which is a which is 3D printed part. Now traditionally vacuum forming tools could be made of metal and they need to be drilled um, for the vacuum to draw the plastic to the surfaces. In 3D printing, 3D printing allows you to do um, to make the part porous in the areas you wish to have more draw and more solid in areas where you don't. So you don't have to do a drilling operation, you, you design it into the part uh, uh, before it's printed. That simplifies the, the, the process. And also there's materials available here that are able to work easily to 200 degrees C and performing plastics such as Kydex. The second tool, middle left, is a hydroforming tool made of polycarbonate. Uh, it can also be made of Altum. And this is uh, shaping metal blanks in a hydropress. Uh, polycarbonate's good to about 5,000 pounds. Um, 
All TIMs are 10,000 roughly and above. The tool below it is pulp molding, and it uses the same um, features as the vacuum forming tool uh, by building porosity into the tool. It actually has a pulp mold on top of it, a cup holder. And with with the porosity, the you're able to draw a vacuum to bring the pulp to the surface of the of the tool to form that shape, and then it's dried and then extracted. So these Plastic tools can be used for low volume production in thousands, but typically these products, when they're running full productions, like a cup holder like this, will be running millions. But to prove the concept, get a good number of prototypes or small production runs of specialty um, products, it is a usable, a fully usable tool. Uh, the top right is an example of a print, 3D printed injection mold insert. An advantage here is being able to get a part made of end use plastic out very quickly without having to go to um, um, tool production. Uh, the middle with the red bottle is a similar example, but it's a blow molding tool. We're able to make complex patterns, writing and whatnot without having to go through any manufacturing steps except 3D printing. Bottom right is an Altum part used for um, a carbon fiber layup. So what it does is it you apply fiber uh, fiber cloth and a and a an epoxy type um, compound, then it goes into an autoclave at high temperature to cure the um, the carbon fiber piece. Then it's removed and used in the process um, as a part. The alternative way would be to machine a surface of whatever the material required is to, to produce the same results. Here's a kind of a larger, it's a composite um, layup tool for also for uh, composites such as carbon fiber. This one here is much larger. It's made of Altum 1010, which has the uh, lowest CTE and high temperature capabilities, it's also very strong. It is made of four parts. I think this thing is about six feet long. And uh, the interior you can see is made sparse, not to waste, pl waste plastic and also to minimize the weight, but still keeping the strength and the geomet geometric stability of the part. Traditionally, a tool like this is assembled, then it's finished to provide a smooth surface, and then it's used for, um, for forming large uh, carbon fiber parts. And more automotive exciting applications. Champion Motorsports um, makes aftermarket products for Porsches. And they're like one of the thing, the example here is intake manifolds, uh, which are made of uh, carbon fiber cloth cured. Um, it is formed around uh, soluble cores, uh, which are washed away by liquid solution, including water and a, and a, and a solvent. Um, this creates the ability to, enables the ability to make complex um, shapes, uh, relatively easy, and results in production time savings and in manufacturing cost savings as compared to traditional um, carbon fiber uh, forming methods. Here's a better look at the finished parts where with the mechanical pieces and um, attachments uh, on them. Now a little different application in, in metal forming is Piper Aircraft. They, um, they were able to produce parts in minutes as opposed to hours uh, it takes for a CNC program uh, to be written. And they used plastic printed parts for various metal forming applications.
So once again, the forming tools um, made of plastic result in, in time and cost savings. Um, they're able to produce many structural components, different geometries. So you can imagine there is low volume, many different geometries, frame components, brackets, skins. Um, then also they, they were also producing a routing drill and trim fixtures as well for, for the same parts. So manufacturing process that uses FDM plastics uh, with polycarbonate and altum, and this shows the pressures they're able to, to use to, when, when, when forming the metals. Okay, 3D printing does not require an operator, does not require programming. Uh, it, it basically is unattended. So once you're sending a print job to the printer, you come back and when it's ready, and then you have your part to start to work with. This is a more specific example of metal forming using polycarbonate and altum. So you know, this, this, this tool is used to form two millimeter mild steel um, using 14,000 PSI. This is kind of an interesting thing because when we first saw it, I go like, wow, plastic bending to a two millimeter steel, it can't be done. <laughs> And then we saw the parts, it's like, wow, it's, it's possible. And this is a great way to make very complex shapes that would go through quite a few traditional metal forming operations. And you can see from the time, it's 22 hours. It's a great improvement. Well, and it looks like we've kind of flown through this and that was kind of the intent not to dwell on any particular area but sort of to give some ideas that you know get people thinking get you guys thinking if there's any applications that uh, potentially can benefit and help you help you out in your processes um please feel free to contact paul um or neil or myself uh, if you have any questions or would like to dig, dive deeper into any of these subjects and um, thank you for your time. And Paul, do you need to, would you like to add anything to this? Yeah, James, we re re really want to thank you for the presentation today. What the couple of comments that I wanted to make that I'm always, you know, uh, I've, I've been sort of doing this, like both James and I have been doing this for the last six years. But what I'm always impressed with is just with the time savings. Uh, that you get from using additive. Like I know we talk about, you know, money savings of, oh, you know, this part was, you know, $500 instead of 1500. But I think it, it's always the time savings that impresses me that you're going from things that are taking weeks and months down to hours and days. And, and I can't stress enough that everything that you've seen today, you can work with Humber College to accomplish. I, I think, you know, the aspect on their, their additive uh, side and our uh, uh, Symmetrix uh, partners, uh, Javelin Symmetrix partnership with them is right now is that they, they have two of our highest level uh, FDM, uh, fused deposition uh, commercial printers, and they have the full range of uh, engineered plastics, you know, including things like nylon 12, carbon fiber and Ultum. Uh, but I think the unique, you know, we work with other colleges and universities, but I think the unique aspect of Humber and the Barrett Center is that you've got the likes right there of uh, KUKA Canada, of Festo, and, and the things that James is talking about of design, redesigning these tools, you're incorporating you know, the 3D printing with the traditional manufacturing, with the robotics, with the end of arm tooling. At Humber, you can be bringing all these these things together and proving out uh, your ideas, you know, with that. So I, I think this is, you know, really a, a unique center to be able to work with industry uh, for that. You know, w we can have a Q&A now if people have questions, uh, but uh, just to start off, you know, you can type in some questions if you have, and if we don't have time to get to it, you know, we'll make sure that everyone's questions get answers. But, but James, if I could just ask, you know, I'll, I'll throw you some, some questions. Uh, Thanks. What, what, what would you say, you know, are the most common applications that companies get started with in, uh, in additive? Well, so, you know, that's a kind of an easy start. Um, thanks for easy question. Um, the most companies are seeing um, additive mentioned or 3D printing mentioned for prototyping. 
and they just kind of get all interested in that and you know they get on the 3d printing prototype bandwagon start looking into things and sometimes they get like really surprised that things actually cost money the machines but uh so traditionally we you know we try to discover you know what they're actually what they're actually asking for what they're looking for and hopefully we get a look at um get a walk through and sort of try to advise them what the best applications are for 3d printing in their environment try to help uh, determine if they have an ROI for a machine because it doesn't make sense to to get into 3D printing with a with a hobby machine because then you're spending a lot of time learning how to become a hobby machine 3D printing specialist rather than using it as a tool. The tool is using you, and so you know. So if they're going to be considering production environment and they're worried about uh, an automotive or in medical or industrial or whatever, and they're worried about how much material costs per kilogram, and can we run PLA, you know, so they're looking at that, it's a short term, short sighted, it, it's, it's not meant to be in salt, but it's short sighted. And if you look at what the function of the 3D printing gives you, and in terms of value, cost saving, part price, that's what should be looking and ROI, that's what should be being considered um, <clears throat> not material costs. So we usually don't talk about machines. We like to discuss applications and find out if somebody has an, if a customer has an ROI <clears throat> and where the ROI is sitting. And engineering is R and D is rarely an ROI ever. It's mostly in the production side, um, manufacturing side, safety side, ergonomic side. Okay, so, thanks. Like we start the discussion prototyping and if it ends there it's a very short one usually or there is a huge demand for like in consumer market where it, it's all about prototyping and visual look and uh, the you know concept models that look like the end use part okay thanks james we, we do have an online question uh from benjamin and, and i figure we might as well tackle this you know here and there uh, you know, part of this could be a little bit of a, a trick question in a way. Uh, and, and, you know, James, maybe we can both uh, do this. Uh, you know, Benjamin is just asking, what was the infill typically used for the forming tools? And from, from my experience with this, uh, Benjamin, the, and my background is also from mechanical engineering, you know, the infill is, is part of what, you know, has to be worked out, you know, for those, those pressures and, you know, where, where it's needed, where I think where it's, in certain areas where it has to be, you know, the infill has to be uh, to a higher degree, but it's also that, that's also something that, you know, like through Humber and working with them, we, you know, you can be figuring out. The, the great thing about the printers uh, that Humber has with the Fortis 450 is that it, it, it operates on a software called Insight. So you're actually able to, uh, instead of, you know, using the general defaults, you're able to customize the, the tool path and the print. So you can have different infills in different areas where there are higher stress uh, uh, stress concentrations, and and also you can be deciding along with the infill, you know, how many uh, shells and how many layers are on the outside. And maybe James, if you want to comment uh, about that too. Yeah. So if you're looking at a metal forming tool like this, you would want it to be solid for best strength. And uh, as Paul mentioned, the the print software is a technique to uh, to make sure it's fully dense. And most of the parts are usually like 99%. But if you want to stretch the limits of a, of a, of a product, um, you can go in and uh, overfill and make it even denser. So I would say for forming tools, you want full density as best as possible. And then if, you, if you're working with polycarbonate and you exceed its limits, you move up to the next material that uh, can do the job better. And you, you, know, you kind of know this at the start of the gate by knowing what the material is and thickness and pressures. And so you can sort of start at the right range. But for, for metal forming, solid tend to be solid for layup tools and end of arm tools, a combination depending on, on the strength and um, what you're handling and holding tools are the same. They can look bulky, but they don't necessarily need to be solid. Uh, there is a, the sparsity of a part, sparseness, 
sparsity, sparseness, whichever, they can be controlled to a very fine degree. Uh, whether you want as sparse as possible for big blocky parts or as solid as you need for um, for parts that are taking, um, holding, withstanding some force. And um, we didn't discuss anything in, in terms of like how things are done, but there's possibility for ins metal inserts into parts and those areas have to be made solid to be able to hold the metal insert um, securely. Metal inserts like drill, drill guides, um, and um, what do you call it? Uh, not, um, not inserts. Is that, that answer that question? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Actually, uh, Benjamin uh, answered back perfect. I was curious if you ended up uh, having to go with solid. Thank you. Uh, there's another question uh, from Rosie. Uh, are these printers suitable for textiles? Could they utilize plastic materials to be used in carpeting, interior design, etc.? The FDM uh, printers, you know, that uh, uh, Humber has right now, this is all for harder engineered plastics. One of the things that they have access to through us and, and, and you know, will be, you know, I think getting into is our, some of our other technology, which is our polyjet technology, where you're, where you can actually mix uh you have a material mix as well as you know material properties so that you can have flexible materials you can have material colors these are part of our, our polyjet line with our j55 and and uh, uh j850 uh materials so that and and these you know the the fdm is more from the engineering side our polyjet is more from the design side and industrial designers and you know uh, architects and, and and people looking at the design and the color and the mix and that um, uh, a question from andy can can you use composites meaning can you mix materials within your 3d printers james maybe you can just talk about yes, our, our nylon 12. yeah so there are materials that have composite structures uh nylon 12 cf is a 35 percent uh carbon fiber um, nanotube content by weight. It's one of the most dense, carbon fiber dense materials um, available for 3D printing. It produces very strong light parts, uh, can replace metal in a lot of applications. Not designed for really for end use, but can be used uh, in for end use, but jigs and fixtures, holding fixtures, uh, other tools, um, it's a great material for it. it keeps. It keeps its uh, shape, stiffness, and whatnot over a distance, so it's it's a great material to use. Um, uh, there's other materials that are, you know, uh, that are good for um, strength, uh, chemical resistance, uh, static dissipative materials. Uh, so there's a wide range of materials uh, available for FDM printing. And I think this comes back to, you know, when people ask us, say, you know, do you have composites can you use this? Our first thing, as James has said, is, you know, we weren't here talking about, you know, our printers and, and, and the, the actual printers that Humber has. The whole thing is, we're, we're, you know, it's always approaching it. What's the problem? What's the application? And then finding the best solution, you know. Uh, from that aspect and, and starting from that aspect of the of the problem so it, it doesn't you know it looks like we're we're out of time now uh, uh, we uh, uh, you know uh, from our side from Javelin we want to thank everyone from joining you know we uh, we really enjoy working with uh, Humber College uh, you know on so many different levels uh, you know they have our support with our uh, you know our, our technical team as well as from Stratasys so you know what we love to do is to solve problems. So please, you know, uh, give Anthony, give Neil a call, uh, use the facilities there. It, it's, as I said, it's, it, they are very unique uh, within the, the post-secondary uh, setting here uh, in Ontario and, and in fact in Canada. Um, and, uh, you know, give us a call if we can help. And I'll just turn it back to Elizabeth to uh, sum up for the day. Thanks everyone. Thank you Thanks, so Mary. much. Thank you, Paul and James. Uh, this wraps up our Reignite Our Manufacturing Engine webinar series. So thank you all for making the time again this week. Uh, we've really enjoyed it and we're, we've learned a lot. I've got um, one more um, slide to share with a little bit more contact information. So I'm just gonna pull that up real quick and then we can be on with our day.
Um, we go. So this is Neil Muhammad's contact information, director of the Barrett Center for Technology Innovation. For a copy of the recording, here's my email and our general email is askbarrettcti at humber.ca. So thank you again, James. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, and thank, thank you all for, Thanks, for making the time. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, good morning. afternoon. James, take care. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks for the music. That's awesome.